Today my title is, and if you saw it out there, Triumphant Entry to Terrible Ending. And I've already had some critique on that, so that's cool. Uh, I want to explain where we're going with it in a minute. But I want to say that we're looking at Jesus' last week. From being praised as the King of the Jews, to being despised and killed as the King of the Jews. Last week, we finished our look at Psalm 34, which I call, The Lord Will Look After You. It was appropriately done just before this, because I wanted you to understand before we went into this week, that the Lord will look after you, that he cares for you. Here's a thoughtful picture that gives us an idea of what the Israelite people might have asked God the day they stood at the edge of the Red Sea with the Egyptian army coming up behind them. If you want to read that story, it's in Exodus 13 and 14 in the Old Testament of the Bible. But take a look at that. Can you imagine them saying, why are you taking me through troubled water? And he says, because your enemies can't swim. All right? Sometimes he does things with us and for us, and we don't understand why. But he does. And as we look at this story of the week before the crucifixion, and we call this Palm Sunday because of the palm leaves and the different things like that. This picture takes even more meaning as we look at this. The apostles were about to find out how God would get them through the worst time of their life. The most troubled time of their lives. This was a really, really scary week for the new church. But let's, let's go back to the triumphant entry first. Because this is the beginning of this week. And you've got to understand, Jesus is approaching Jerusalem from Lazarus' home in Bethany. And you've got to remember that just before this, we heard the story of Lazarus being brought back from the dead. So he's over there visiting with Lazarus and his mom, and he's got a crowd of people with him, and they're walking off to Jerusalem. And it's a pretty happy time. Everybody's having a good time, and they're headed to the Feast of the Passover. And they're going to go, and they're going to celebrate in the city this great feast, this remembrance of Passover, of the Old Testament. Well, let's have a look at it. John 12, verses 12 and 13. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. This is a crowd of people who come every year to Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, instead of going to the temple and and praising God and having this feast, they leave town. And they head out on the road and they're dragging the palm leaves. And and we learned a couple years ago that those palm leaves were pretty precious because they didn't grow there. They had to bring them in for this event. And they... They drag these things out there and then they drop them on the road and they're yelling and screaming about this guy coming forth towards Jerusalem. Just another pilgrim coming to the village or to the city. And, and it must have really shocked the rest of the people in the city because they didn't know what was going on. And I can imagine how the church leaders felt because it was their big event. And the government was like, well, we were doing crowd, crowd control, but hmm, they kind of got out of hand. And away they go. But at least they're leaving town, so that's okay. So, so it was a kind of a different event as they came. But they were singing Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And you know, when they were saying this and they were shouting it and they were so excited and they didn't even know who he was. They thought he was going to be the king. They thought he was going to dethrone the existing king and, and become the king. They had no idea of who he really was. But it was fun, and it was exciting. They got caught up in the fervor of it. There's a similar occurrence to this in Revelation 7, 9 to 12. I want you to listen to this. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude of that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, 
Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and the elders and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. I almost lose my breath trying to do that. Can you imagine the glory? Can you imagine the awe that was going on there? They're in the presence of God eternally in the presence of God, and they're bowing down and they're praising him. This is what was happening in Jerusalem in a very, very tiny way. Because in Revelations, they knew who the Lamb was. They knew that he was God. And they knew what he had done. In Jerusalem, they only thought they knew. And they were excited about it. And they had a good party. And they had a good time. But you know, like all good parties and all good times, it kind of gets old after a while. And people get busy with their lives again and they go away. And they don't, the party doesn't keep going. There's no such thing on this earth as a 365-day party. All right? We have to take time out and do different things. But let's go back to the arrival of Jesus. John 12, verses 14 to 16. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, as it is written. And by the way, what Barb read was that story about how that donkey got picked. All right? Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And that's from Zechariah 9.9. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. You hear that? At first, his disciples did not understand all this. They didn't get what, he was, what was being said. The king is going to arrive on a donkey. What kind of a trip is that? A white stallion, yes. But a donkey? At first, his disciples did not understand at all. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. You have to understand if they understood the part about the donkey, they also understood the part about what they did afterwards, what the rest of this week brought. All right? And so they would have then, after that realization, it would have been hard. It would have been tough. Don't be afraid. Your king is coming seated on a donkey. Well, guess what, people? Don't be afraid. Your king is coming on a stallion, on a white charger. He promises that. Can you imagine that? We get a bigger horse. We get him coming out of the sky. That's what our promise is. That's what we're looking forward to. Are we going to see it any more than these people did? Or are we going to miss it and not realize what's happening? That's a thought. That's a thought. John 12, 17 to 19, we carry on. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. A bunch of gossips. All right? They couldn't contain it. He raised him from the dead. Can you believe that? He, Lazarus is good, alive. He's walking. He's with his mom. Did you realize what he did? How could he do that? Again, part of that amazement was the fact that they still didn't really realize that Jesus was God. But they're getting there. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. They were trying to keep him in low key. They were trying to keep Jesus out of the sight, out of sound, and that nobody even really realized who he was. And they said, Look how the whole world has gone after him. And that set the tone for what happened in this week. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And I'll paraphrase and I'll add another line. And we can't have that. The Pharisees and the Sadducees could not handle what was going on. And so they put into motion the whole thing about Jesus going to trial and being executed. 
So you see, the people were excited and talkative about this guy named Jesus. They were growing in numbers and making more noise. And as that crowd now came back toward Jerusalem, it must have really upset the government and the church leaders. Throughout the week are the events of Jesus' time with his disciples. As I mentioned to the kids, there's the Last Supper. There's the predictions of what's coming that he tells his disciples. And then there's that betrayal and the arrest of Jesus on the mountain. And then taken down before the courts and before the, the, the religious leaders. And the whole process, and watch the Easter movie if you want. The whole process of him being tortured and questioned and, and shunned. And guess what? It was the officials doing that part of it. But who was telling them to do it? That same crowd who were yelling and shouting, here comes the king. And now they're going, how can he dare say he's the king of the Jews? He's obviously lying. He's obviously, he's obviously a fraud. They started grumbling. They started making sounds against him. And you know why they did that? Because they were scared. Because once you walk back in to the realm of the powerful, you get scared about what you're going to say and do. And when they came into the city of Jerusalem, this was the core of the government. This is the core of the church. This is the place where now they had to, if they were going to yell and scream and holler, everybody saw them. Out there on the road, it was one thing. But in the village, it was another. But you know what's so neat about all this? It was predicted. It was prophesied. It was told to the disciples, this is what's going to happen. Could they imagine when he was on the road and all those people were, were joyous? Could they imagine those same people would turn on him? I don't think so. I think it was something that they just found as a real scary thing. And we're told in the different scriptures that the disciples became very scared. As that trial went on, they started to run and hide. And they couldn't believe it. We know the story of Peter who was told he was going to deny Jesus three times. And in that week, he did that. So there's lots of stuff that tells us how ugly that week was. Leads us to our next scripture passage. And the terrible ending that comes from my title. There's no way to make this nice or encouraging. Because it's all about total pain, total loss total sacrifice of an innocent man all because he loved us so much Matthew 27 32 to 40 or we'll do it in pieces 32 and 32 to 34 as they were going out they met a man from Cyrene named Simon and they forced him to carry the cross okay the judgments come down he's going to be crucified he's been whipped and tortured the crown of thorns is on his head he's been flogged all right and now he's carrying this cross, and at some point, he can't do it anymore. He was too weak. Jesus just finally succumbed, and the people around him want him up on that hill. So they grab Cyrene, Simon, and they said, here, you carry it. You're strong and able. You carry this cross, this big wooden cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, and it's still there today. If you want to go to Israel and see it, go to Jerusalem. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. 35, 37 said, When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. He had nothing left. Everything that he had was gone, even his clothes. All he had was his indecent exposure hanging on that cross. That was it. Bloodied, torn, mocked, spat on, and there he hung. That's the terrible ending. Almost. Above his head they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. This was done in mockery. We started out with it being a great thing on the road coming in, and it becomes a mockery at the end. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, 
shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. If you are the son of God, you don't got to do this. No nails can hang you up there. Nobody can keep you there. Come on down. Sound familiar? Way back in the, the temptation days of Jesus when he first got started, he goes out in the wilderness and Satan was trying to get him to do all kinds of things. And he said to him, you can, get, you can jump off this, 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 this tower. You won't get hurt. God will catch you and you're safe. You're, if you're the son of God, you're safe. That time Jesus used scripture to tell Satan to go away. This time Jesus says nothing. From the sixth hour, which is about noon, until the ninth hour, about three, darkness came over all the land. The only thing I can give you as an example of this would be when we have a complete eclipse. It doesn't last three hours, though. But it gets pretty black out there. And I don't know what the, how God did the black, but he made it black for three hours. Must have scared those people something silly. When something strange happens, your mind goes funny. And you start worrying and wondering and thinking about all the possibilities of what it could be. About the ninth hour, that three o'clock, Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To the people around him, they thought, He's calling Elijah. So immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. He can't save himself. Maybe Elijah will save him. Maybe this man is a, a prophet of God. Maybe Elijah will come and save him. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And this is, the, this is the, uh, my favorite verse. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. This great, big, huge curtain that kept man from God. And only the high priest could go in there. Split right down the middle and fell open. Because Jesus is the only way to God. And when he died, that was the ultimate sacrifice. No more animal sacrifices. They didn't need to keep doing that in the temple if they were listening to what happened. The new Christian church knew that. Don't need to do sacrifices anymore. Jesus was the final sacrifice. The white lamb that was given for all of our deaths, for all of our sins. That's what happened. Well, you know, when you start shaking the earth around, things loosen up. We ever you been in an earthquake? Okay. Well, when this one shook, it opened up the graves. The big sepulchers with stones in front of them and everything else, the tombs opened up. And bodies of the many holy people who had died were raised to life. Not just one Lazarus, a whole bunch. And they not only rose up. But they went into the city and walked around. And people recognized them. Which means you know that their bodies were restored. Because bodies who had been decomposed for years and years and years would look like nothing. All right? So they were reburied. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified. And different versions of the Bible give you more to this story. That they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Notice his name changed. The sign above his head, when he was on the cross, said he was the King of Jews. Now they're saying he was the Son of God. That was the transformation that happened that weekend. But well, we're jumping ahead because that's next week. He died on the cross, that ugly, ugly death for us, for each one of us. On the back of Max Licato's book, The Angels Were Silent, I'm going to show you some slides here because you can follow it because everybody says, well, if you're going to quote something, 
Show me. So here we are. This is what it says, and I just really like this. I love the book too, by the way. It's the final week. The players are nearing the stage. The props are being put into position. All of heaven watches. It is the long-awaited week. A week when no angel dared to sing. Imagine that. Here we are singing songs. And in heaven the angels did not dare to sing. Sing. A hush fell over heaven as the God-man faced his final days. Note the firmness in his walk. Hear the conviction in his voice. Witness the courage of his deeds. And then he goes on. See his passion. The Savior who will not give up on his children until they are found. Sense his power. The God who will not tolerate hollow religion. Hear his promise. Hear his promise. The Redeemer who would rather go to hell for you than to go to heaven without you. Isn't that neat? Jesus was prepared to die and go to hell for you rather than leave without you. I'm so excited that my God chose to take a step that no man can take because he loves me so much. I'm so excited about the fact that Jesus beat death. He showed that he has the power over death. And he did it for me and for you. I'm encouraged to be able to say I'm one of his. I'm encouraged to see you saying you're one of his. Next week we're going to look at Easter Sunday. We're going to look at the resurrection. We're going to look at what that meant and how that changed people. But today I want you to remember the cross. On Good Friday service, please go if you can. You'll get a lot better picture of this. But I had to do it in case you don't go. I had to talk about it. The evilness of the cross in mankind's eyes. What they, what they tried to make him. They tried to humble him. They tried to make him insignificant. Just another rabble rouser that got hung on a cross. What they didn't get was you can't keep him there. Okay? There was no hope. What I love also about that cross is up there, there's three pictures. In, in, the, in the poster you'll see for the Good Friday service, if you look around, I forgot to put one up here. Uh, I'll get it up. There's three crosses. The significance of the three crosses is that even at the last minute, you have a chance to say to Jesus, I want to be with you in heaven. Those three crosses can represent death. They can represent your life being torn apart and not fulfilled. And they mean the same thing. You still have that opportunity to say to Jesus, I want to be with you in eternity. That's all it takes. That free gift. What he died on that cross for took away all the, re all the rules and regulations. It took away all the requirements. All you have to do is say, yes, Lord. Now, when you do that, and as we will see next couple of weeks, you will change. Because the Holy Spirit will come alive in you, and you will change. And so if you've accepted Christ, you are changed. And we've seen that. We celebrate this day for what we know today, that our Lord Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, on a donkey to illustrate his plan for peace and salvation. That he is God and wants, to know, wants us to know him and believe in him. That was the idea of arriving in Jerusalem. He had, otherwise, he was just coming to a festival. But he knew what was going to happen when he came. He could have said, you know what, turn that donkey around. I'm not going here. But he didn't. His life on earth was a gift to us, a gift of living forever with him. Just like the crowds in Jerusalem that day, we have the opportunity to celebrate with Jesus and the encouragement to accept the gift of life from him. Are you ready for that? Have you done it already?
I ask a lot of rhetorical questions. I want you to think about them. See where you fit. The next celebration is Good Friday service at 11 o'clock at Bethel Church. Come and witness the sacrifice that Jesus made so we can be joyously alive with him. Joyfully, joyously, whatever word you want to use. It's exciting. Then on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the risen Savior, the reason we're here. He beat death and provided forever the way of salvation through him. Jesus is waiting to celebrate your triumphal entry into his eternal life. He will be shouting Hosanna when you decide to follow him. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for what your son did this week. Lord, he came and he took on all of our sins and he died on that cross for us. But we can sing Hosanna, Lord, because it wasn't the end. And we'll see next week why it wasn't. Thank you for these kids and for their ability to have fun, but yet to understand they're praising God as they wave these palm leaves. Thank you for the teachers that have helped to get it organized. Be with us now as we go this week, Lord. Bless us. Teach us. Help us to know who you are so that we can walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.